is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in him. Whether the sun will shine, whether the skies will rain, I know that you are good, and this is the day you made. Whether in life or death, whether in joy or pain, I know the truth remains, that this is the day you made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Now I can walk in faith, you will protect my way. Your every word is good, this is the day you made. I am a child of yours, you are the one who saves. I am redeemed by God, and this is the day you made. This is the day. And the Lord has made, we will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in This is the day, come and sing your praise for the Lord.
everybody. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Hate to break up the Christmas party. Uh, we got snapper. Got I can't stand listening to him. Too late. I'm sorry, guys. Um. Anyway, so what I was saying is, uh, Mr. Mickey, Mr. Mickey, hey, Mr. Mickey, can you how Too how late. can you stand there and just listen to him talk? Hunter, he's the what? Hunter, what? What are you doing? I mean, I don't know, but. I got a beef with you, I think. I have, I have, I don't know what it is. I just have a problem when you get up there and start talking. It Hunter, really bothers me. I don't, I don't know why. You gotta stop doing this. You can't just do this every so often. Every time we have an event, like you get mad at me about it. Well, I mean, tell me how to fix it. I don't know. Okay. Well, look, you got a conflict with me uh-huh. from talking. Yep. Ab- maybe there's. Maybe there's some kind of class we can take. Maybe there's some kind of some some thing that we can sit through and listen to and, and dive into the word. And maybe we can find out how we can maybe manage this conflict. Maybe we can make peace somehow. What do you think? What what's up there seems pretty oh good. Oh my gosh. Oh guys, look, there's a you got this here. This Wednesday night, we're starting back. Okay. Seven o'clock, the adults meet. We meet over there in the small group room downstairs, and we're gonna have a series. And this series is on conflict management. It's making peace, okay? So uh, maybe Hunter can learn how to manage this conflict without just bursting out in the middle of church. I'm, I'm quite a, I freak out quite often, as you all know. He's got a hot head, guys. I'm so sorry about that. Sorry about that. I mean, oh, I know what it was. Yeah. You, I thought you were going to mention beaver kids. I thought you were going to forget that. I was about to make a pour the booze start, and that's a and that's a good point. That's a good point. Beaver Kids starts back this this week, this Wednesday night. We start at six. The kids eat for free. We have a missions meal, um, and then after that, the students eat, and then the adults eat at six thirty. Right, the missions money there goes to Liberty Baptist Church in Romania. It helps fund their camps that they've had going on these just these past few weeks. Um, but bring your kids. There's there's something for everyone of all ages. All the kids that you got, bring them. Uh, your friends, your neighbors, just bring them, okay, because we have a great time on Wednesday night. Also, I will say this, Hunter is our fearless leader of the Beaver Kids. He doesn't always act this way with the kids, okay? Yeah, yeah, he, will not, he will not act this way in front of the children. This is strictly a thing between him and Hunter, okay? Can we get fixed now? Yeah. I know what to do. Yeah, we're going to learn how to manage this in, in this conflict management series, okay? We are going to continue our service after we get past that, whatever the heck that was, and we're going to get into our word of the week, right? We've been doing this the past couple weeks, and the word of the week is something, uh, if you look in your bulletin, you can see it on the right page there. We have these scriptures that we've been aiming to memorize. Last week, we had some volunteers that were willing to say the verse from memory, and Today, we're hoping for the same thing. So, uh, would anybody like to say the first one? The first one coming out of Mark. Aiden? I believe, help my unbelief. That's right. That's right. How about that? No, no props for that? He gets no props for remembering that? I think he does. At least a little bit. That's Mark 9, 24. Hebrews eleven six is the next one. Who wants to? Oh, my goodness. I got... I got so many hands here. I got so many hands. Let's go. I don't want the preacher's wife to be mad at me. Hey, you all right? Hebrews eleven six. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For with whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews eleven six. How about that? How about that? How about that? Great job, great job. If you look in there, our word of the week this week, Luke 12, 15. So take one of this home with you or take a picture of it, study it, remember it. When you go to bed at night with your spouse, talk about it, uh, try to say it to each other. And then the next one is Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Okay, now we're going to get into our confession time.
Hebrews 10, 19 says, and a couple of verses after that say this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through this flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil and conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. For believers, we have this assurance of Christ. We have this assurance that we have a high priest who intercedes for us, who also paid the price for our sins. So we can come boldly before the throne, confessing our sins, knowing that those have already been taken care of. If you're not a believer, you can have that assurance as well. We, we go through this weekly as a reminder for, for us to, to keep short accounts with the Lord, um, relying on Him throughout the week, not just on Sunday mornings during this time, but throughout the week, daily, moment by moment, as we deal with sin, as we confess our sins to the Lord. Not saving them up for Sunday, but a reminder for every moment to evaluate where we are before the Lord whether our attitudes and whether our actions are, are pleasing and in, in obedience to his word and whether or not to come to him in confession during that time. So let's do that now. And if you don't have the assurance that we believers have, uh, you can have that today as well if you put your faith in Christ. Repent and believe, the Bible tells us, and we can be saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for the assurance that we have in his finished work on the cross. We thank you for direct access to you through, through Christ. We don't have to have a priest. We don't have to have um, a man here on earth to come before you for us. We have the God-man. We have Christ who speaks on our behalf, who intercedes for us. Father, we, we fail often. We don't recognize it often. But our faith is in Christ, who never failed, and who speaks on our behalf. So we, we confess those things, we turn away from those things, and we put our trust in you. Christ, let me pray. Amen.
Just a more upbeat song before we have to read scripture there. <laughs> but, all right, our scripture reading is going to be in Philippians 4, 10 through 14. That's going to be 1166 in your Black Pew Bible. Um, I do uh, GE Power Company. It's Galatians, Ephesians. Philippians and Colossians, that kind of helps me with those. All right. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Yeah. 
We'll turn your Bibles back to the teaching text that Lonnie taught us. Philippians chapter 4, back uh, page 1166 in the Black Pew Bible. If you don't have one, it would help you to pull out, if you don't have a Bible with you, pull out that Black Pew Bible and read along with us. I think you'll benefit more from doing that. It's worship day. I don't know where you would rather be than with the church family being together and singing praises and singing truth. And now we're going to study truth. And it's good to see the Lawrence is here. Josh and Mallory moved a bit ago to East Tennessee, and they're back in town visiting with us. So they're sitting over here. Raise your hand. So they'll see you. Mallory loves that. She loves that attention. She just loves that. But make sure you uh, spend a little time with them. Uh, we don't get to see them very often. Love them, sweet folks. And uh, it's good to see them here. Um, we, we change up our service sometimes, and um, we do the announcements. We used to do them at the beginning, and now we do them at the end. But this is kind of why we do that. Rodney and I were with a shut-in, uh, visiting shut-ins this week, and they said, uh, they mentioned Chris. They said, you need to give Chris more pulpit time. And I thought, well, and they're like, yeah, he, he was at the beginning. And sometimes we would, when Chris would finish up, then I would cut it off. And I said, well, that's why we moved him to the end. So now you got to watch the whole service, and then you get to, you get to listen. To no, hey, brother, that's true. That's a true story. That's a true story. Yeah, yeah, we don't lie at, in the pulpit. We don't do it in the pulpit. Hey, 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 you, yeah. <laughs> so mine have to, mine have to pull out the. We start Genesis next week. Um, Mike Van Slott's going to be here, pastor from Fellowship Oshawa. We were there this summer. He's uh, going to be down here in uh, Judy, and he's going to begin our study of Genesis next week. Um, but we've outlined that text. I mean, outlined the book, and, and Morgan and I are, and, and some others are going to be preaching. But you might have to grab a text and preach for us. But that was, that was what I was told. So anyway, take your time when you get up here and do announcements, all right? Take your time. Um, I'm going to ask the second graders and under, if they would, to come and line up at the, line up at the door uh, to go to Children's Church. Line up at the door here. Here we go. There you go. Getting your stage time. Just like your daddy. <laughs> All right. Philippians chapter 4. I, I really am excited about Wednesday night. People have been like, man, I can't wait to get back together again. We just don't get to see each other enough. And we have small groups that meet on Sunday morning. They meet on Sunday night. Uh, but Wednesday night, we kind of take July and the first part of August off, just give our teachers a break. And everybody can vacate and do their vacation. But we are real excited about being back together on Wednesday night and helping Hunter deal with his uh, uh, flesh and dealing with conflicts. We're excited about that. Philippians 4, verses 10 through 14. My family, we lived overseas. And at this specific time, that I'm going to tell you about. It was Jenny and myself, uh, Carly and Anna Grace. And Jenny was eight months pregnant with Clara Beth. And it was time of the spring festival, the Chinese New Year. And that's the greatest human migration in the world. Everybody goes home. They may not see their family but once a year, but they go home during Chinese New Year. And so we had uh, planned. We bought tickets. We were leaving um, our city taking a few hour, couple hour train ride to the provincial capital where we will fly from there to another city and then fly to Thailand where we were planning to be there uh, with the, for the arrival of Clara Beth. And it, it came a storm. And where we lived, probably the same latitude as central Florida. So it was really hot, subtropical climate, didn't snow very often. Had the storm of the century there. Everything was iced over. Um, we get on the train, and we go, and we didn't have our coats because we're going a few hours. We're going to a provincial capital. We'll take a cab to the airport where we'll fly out of the, uh, out of the country. And in Thailand, it's, it's hot, so we didn't bring a lot of clothes. We just won't have to carry all that stuff. So we get on this train, and a few hours turned into 36 hours. And it's standing room only on the train. It's not just, they don't just sell a seat. You know, you got seats here. No, it's the aisles and how many we can get in there. So it's just packed full of people. And the train kept stopping. And, they, and people were asking, like, what's going on? Why is the train stopping? And, and they said, well, we're having some mechanical problems. 
And uh, that happened time and time again. And we would stop, and then a train would go by us, and we just couldn't figure out what was going on. But it, it, it became a, a problem uh, because it was uh, cold, and the, the train was full. I mean, standing room only in the aisles. And, every, you know, people are standing there, you know, five, six, seven, eight hours into this thing. And uh, then the train began to run out of food and water. And so it became... a uh, um, kind of a sticky situation. And then it got worse because the, the, the um, attendants on the train approached us and said, hey, we're, we're scared for your safety. We're going to ask you to come with us. And so my family and our, our teammates that were with us, we went to the back of the train and they stuck us in a car with a, a Chinese family. And they shut the door. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of getting, you know, making us a little anxious. Jenny's pregnant. We're really wanting to get out of the country so she can have this baby in Thailand and no clothes, running out of food and water. Um, and then we heard this roar. And it was the, the people on the train were beginning to get unruly. And it got louder and louder until they're in our our, um, our room had a door that was latched, and they began to beat on, the screaming and yelling. We couldn't understand what they were saying, and they began to beat on the door of our car there, of our little compartment, little sleeper car. And we didn't know what was going on, and the Chinese family that was with us, they didn't know what was going on, and, and they're screaming back and forth and trying to figure out, why are you beating on? Well, we'd been told that we're scared for your safety, and all of a sudden there's a riot on the train. And they're trying to get in the door to get... We didn't know. We just assumed they're trying to get at us. And so my, my, my buddy Steve, we got by the door, and we had our, you know, my wife and kids and his wife and this Chinese family, they're back in the back. And, and we just, Steve and I was like, hey, if they get through the door, just tear into them. I mean, we didn't know what was going on. Well, after a while, that noise kind of dissipated and moved away. Um, 36 hours later, we had an attendant come and open the door and usher us real quickly off the train. And as we're getting off the train, we're looking, the train is just tore all to pieces. I mean, all the lights, everything's just tore all up. We had some friends that were, Chinese friends that were on the train, and, and later they told us they, they weren't trying to get at us, the foreigners on the train. They m mistakenly thought that there was some food on the train, and it's in our car. Well, we get off the train and we go, we're in our provincial capital, we missed our flight. Now what do we do? We had to get a hotel. We get a hotel and it's, it's days we're there. We're trying to get a flight out of the provincial capital. And we're, we're calling in, you know, in, a, in a second language, trying to get tickets and trying to figure it all out. There are not, not very many flights going out of the airport because it never snows there and never is icy. And we know we have to get into Thailand because Jenny's going to have this baby. And we're like, man, we don't have this baby here. And um, we were really struggling. And finally got a ticket. And they said, yeah, if you can get here in 30 minutes, we've got a flight for you. Well, we're an hour away from the airport. And so that happened several times. And it got to where we had our bags packed and we were just ready for When they gave, gave us the call, we we're going to grab our bags and get out, you know, hail a taxi and get on to the airport. We finally, somehow, we got to the airport. I don't know how, still don't even know how. They ushered us through all the, the, the crowds, and we got on this plane, and we flew from that city to a, a city called Kunming, and it's a nickname, the Spring City, because it's always like 78 degrees there. And uh, we love flying through there because it was like nothing like where we lived. And we get there, and we bought tickets on a flight later that day to go to Thailand. And it's just been five, six days of just intense, um, every emotion you can imagine, just fear and anxiety and angst. And, and I remember Jenny, she had our paperwork, and she had to process this uh, paperwork for a visa, extended visa, because uh, we're going to have the child there, going to spend several days. And so she goes in, and I have... Carly and Anna Grace there. And I'll never forget it. There was a, we're in the Thai embassy inside, you go inside the gate and there's a little patch of grass there. And it was like this lush grass. And it was just incredible because we didn't have grass in our city. 
Now, it, it was the rainy season. We hadn't seen the sun in a, in a, you know, in a while. And it was warm, and there's grass. And so I got those girls, and we just laid down in that grass. And I looked up, and there's blue sky. There was never blue sky in our city. We never saw a blue sky in 10 years in our city. But there's blue sky, and the sun is hitting me in the face. And then those two girls just laying there beside me, and we just, and I just remember this spontaneous rejoicing in the Lord, just crying out to God, just thanking them. Because I'd been through six days of just tension and struggle and fear and all those that worry and all of that. But there's just, just outpouring of praise to the Lord and his goodness uh, to us. And Jenny came out and she said, all right, we got it, we can go. And I said, no, baby, let's just stay here for a few minutes. And I just, just, ah, oh, just laying in that grass. It's almost when we do the snow angel thing in the grass, you know, just grass and the sun. It was just a, incredible. I'll, I'll never forget that moment. I remember telling her, it's like, man, this is what heaven, glimpse of heaven. But I was really content just to be there for, for a little while. But this is spontaneous praise going up to the Lord because of um, what the Lord had brought us through. And, and um, So Paul, as we're in this text today, Philippians chapter 4, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. He'd been teaching them, you know, despite your circumstances, you can have joy and be content. And you would think as he's writing, if you're reading this um, letter, if you didn't know where he's writing from, you'd think, oh, he must be um, writing from some palace somewhere, a very comfortable place. But, but no, he isn't. He's, he's in prison in Rome. In fact, this is called a, a prison epistle. You have Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. They were all written at the same time, about the same time, in about 60, 61 A.D. And Paul had started this church on a second missionary journey and he's answering questions how to be content how can we have joy or how can we rejoice amidst difficulties and the answer is given in the midst of a thank you note this is Paul's thank you letter he's writing back to the church in Philippi for their support for him and and what he does here in verse 10 he spontaneously gives a shout of joy for what the Lord had done for him and how he had used the Philippian church to meet his needs so we're fixing we're fixed to look at verse 10, but just think about where we are. The last few weeks, like I said, we're starting Genesis next Sunday, but we've been talking about unbelief, lack of faith. We looked at Numbers 13, and we saw the nation of Israel. They were told by God that he was going to give them the land. All I had to do go, is go in and take it, but yet they didn't believe. The majority of them didn't believe God, and it says that they didn't enter their rest, and they died in the wilderness. We talked about how so many people in, in the world, they don't trust the Lord. They don't believe His Word. They're not willing to repent and believe, and so they're not going to enter their rest. And then we talked about how but we as believers, we, we believe, but yet we, still, we also struggle with unbelief, don't we? We're like the the father of the demoniac son who was mute and the disciples couldn't cast out the demon and the father asked if Jesus could cast him out, would he be willing to? And Jesus says, if I'm able, of course I'm able. If you believe, it'll be done. And the Father says, I believe. That's one of our memory verses. I believe. Lord, help my unbelief. And that's us, isn't it? And that should be our prayer. Lord, I believe. I trust you. For us that are Christians, yes, I believe. I'm, I'm trusting in Christ for my salvation. I'm trusting in what, I'm, what I've done or what I can do. No, I'm trusting the work of Christ. Christ lived a perfect life, and he died a terrible death, suffering the wrath of the Father on my behalf. He was buried. On the third day, he rose. The Bible says, for my justification. Father, I'm trusting you for that. I have eternal life, not because of me, but because of Christ and because of your mercy. But yet, even if Greg is people who trust the Lord, yet we still struggle with unbelief. We don't trust Him as we should. And what's the result? Last week we looked at that. What's the result of, of not trusting 
God not taking him at his word is we have, we have anxiety. And there's a lot of other things we have we struggle with. But we lack faith, and so as a result, there's this anxiety that happens in our life. And we're all, we all struggle with anxiety. And for all of us, we're anxious because we don't trust his word as we should. And we all struggle with it. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Just as unbelief leads to anxiety, unbelief can also lead to discontentment, something we, we also all struggle with. Any of you not content? How many of you this week thought, man, I'm, I don't know why I didn't get the raise and he got it. I don't know why they get paid more than I do. How is it that that guy has all the, the big house and the nice truck and the boat and the toys, and I don't? Maybe you're a, a student and you get to drive, to drive to school, but you're driving a banger. But then you, one of your friends or a classmate, they're driving a, a new car. Why is that? Because their parents are crazy, that's why. Yeah, you ever struggle with discontentment? Yeah, I think we do. I do, and I think you do as well. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Hear this. See Paul as he gives this spontaneous shout of joy. He's rejoicing at what the Lord has done for him in Christ through the Philippian church. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no Opportunity. And so, first thing we learn from our text is that God is the provider and giver of all good things. We should rejoice in Him. See, the Philippians had put together a care package, if you will, for the Apostle Paul, and they had sent it by way of Epaphroditus. And when they weren't able to get him more support, it wasn't because they didn't have concern, they just didn't have the opportunity. Hence the phrase, now at length. You see that? Now at length there in verse 10. But this wasn't their only time they helped Paul. Look at verse 15 of Philippians 4. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, Macedonia is like the region. It's like West Tennessee. No church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So this church in Philippi, they really loved Paul, and they would really helped him a lot. Time and time again, giving him, meeting his physical needs. We see it also in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. He's in Corinth. I didn't burden you, Corinthian believers. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. Macedonia, that's the Philippian church. Philippi was in Macedonia. So I refrained and will refrain from burning you in any way. He's in Corinth, and, and who came to his aid? The church in Philippi. So what does Paul do? He's rejoicing. Notice he rejoices in the Lord. He rejoiced in the Lord. He, he's recognizing the generosity in the Philippians. It's not this innate goodness on their part. No, he's rejoicing in the Lord. He, he's saying, I, I see this goodness in you. I, it's not you. It's, it's, it's God in you. So I'm rejoicing in the Lord. There's a, there's a grace that's operative in these believers. And, and, and there's common grace for everybody. Everybody created in the image of God. Every person that's created, they receive common grace from the Lord. But yet, there's a different kind of grace operative in the believer's life. Because see, when he, he calls us out of darkness and he saves us, 
we repent and believe. He doesn't just leave us there. What does he do? No, he gives us grace because Philippians 1, 6 tells us the work he began is he's going to complete. So we as believers, we have more grace. More grace. And God is completing what he began. He's sanctifying us, making us more and more like Jesus. We go through life, have difficult experiences. We lean on him. He gives us grace, more grace, more grace. So Paul is recognizing God's work in their lives. And, and Paul did that in his own life too. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, notice how many times he says grace here. And whenever he's mentioning grace, that means Paul is saying, it's not me, it's him. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. Even Paul recognized his own life. Yeah, this isn't me. The goodness in me, the things that I'm doing, I'm able to do how the Lord's using me. Eh, that's God working in me. That's not me in and of myself. So Paul recognized that in himself, but he's also seeing that in the Philippians. Hey, this is the God's, he recognized God's work in this church. And we should do the same. And I'm looking around seeing a bunch of people here. And I'm seeing you grow in grace. And you're becoming more and more like Jesus. And, and I, it's wonderful and beautiful to see. We need to point that out. Hey, I, I really see the Lord. You've been really been faithful. I see God's evident, God's grace being evident in your life. We should point those things out to one another. We're not what we are going to be. But you know what? We're not what we used to be either. Aren't you glad? Yeah, we're not what we used to be. For sure. So, Paul, recognizing the grace of God in this Philippian church, he's giving praise, rejoicing in the Lord, and we should do the same. The second thing we, we learn from this text is that commitment or contentment is, is learned. Contentment is learned. So, continue to grow in your faith as he gives us his promises. Look at verse 11 and 12. We see this word learn twice. Look at verse 11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He's learned contentment. He's learned contentment. We all struggle with discontentment. You think about the nursery workers there or, or the, little, the little ones going back here to children's church. If you put, you had one toy, one something special, and you put it out in the middle of the group, what's going to happen? Yeah, they all want it. They all want it. They all want it. They're not content. We see discontentment in little ones, but we, we, we all struggle with discontentment in our own lives. But we have to learn to be content. After telling them that he greatly rejoiced in the Lord over this gift that the Philippian church had given him, I think what he's doing here in verse 11, he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need. He doesn't want to mention his neediness. Or if he has a need, he doesn't want to portray that he's needy because What's going to happen, the Philippian church have been so good to him. You know what they're going to do? They're going to start taking up an off another offering for him. Some of you may you have people like that in your life. Maybe it's in our church. There's some people like that in our church. You've got to be real careful what you say around them. You'll mention that you need something or want something, and before you know it, they, they bought it for you. Maybe you have a, a family member. Maybe it's your grandmother or something like that. You have to be real careful because, hey, they'll go overboard. They'll go on and get it for you. You're not wanting them to buy it for you, but they do it anyway. I think that's what's happening here. Paul may or may not have more needs, but he doesn't want to mention it because, really, he's content with what he has. Whether he receives a gift from them or not, he was content. How content are you these days? Are you content in the Lord? There's godliness with contentment, but it's independent of how much money we have and, and how many possessions we have and what kind of house we have and what kind of stuff we have and how many toys we have and what our 401K looks like. I 
Think about Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, David's not saying that because God is my shepherd and I know the Father, the great shepherd is my Father, that I don't have any wants that aren't fulfilled. There's a lot of things we want that aren't, that's not good for us. But what's his point here? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack anything I need. That's what he's saying there. If a per- person is content, you won't hear them saying, you know, someday I'm going to have, someday I'm going to have a better, someday I'm going to have more. If someone's content, they won't be eaten with, up with envy over someone else's achievements or maybe even ministry accomplishments. Someone that is content won't be upset when a coworker gets the raise. They won't be too upset when the competitor gets the gets the job. If a person is content, they're truly grateful for what they have. I love the old man, the the, the grandson asked the old old granddaddy. He said, uh Granddaddy, what? what's your dream car? What's your dream car? And so the granddaddy began to describe this old 78 Ford pickup. Why did the granddaddy describe a 78 Ford pickup? Because that's what he had. The old granddaddy was content. He don't want a new something, something. No, he got, I, I'm, I'm okay with what I have. I'm okay with what the Lord has given me. If our contentment lies in wealth or any earthly possession, then we're in for a big disappointment, aren't we? Because our possessions won't be carried with us, will they? Job, we see that. Job chapter 1, verse 21. Job says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You heard the story about the wealthy man who passed away. He was real well known, and they're at the funeral, and somebody says, Well, how much do you think he left behind? And what's the answer? I love it, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a contentment. Man, it's so hard for, especially in America, the land of plenty. Where everybody's wealthy. If you're like, oh, I'm not wealthy. Yeah, you, you hadn't been anywhere. You're wealthy. Um, it's, it's a difficult thing for us to be content. But I think when we're not content, I think there's evidence that we're not trusting the Lord. I mean, we, we think, have these thoughts. Well, we think the Lord is maybe holding back good things from us. The Lord maybe is depriving us. Does the Lord really have our best interest at heart? If God is really faithful and really benevolent and really good and he's really the good shepherd, why does this person have more than me? Warren Wiersbe, he says, the the word contentment means an inner sufficiency that keeps us at peace in spite of outward circumstances. This inner sufficiency. You could also call that a, a savior sufficiency. That's a result of our our faith in God and faith in His promises. And true contentment comes from godliness in the heart, not wealth in the hand, not wealth in the wallet. A person who depends on stuff is never going to be satisfied because no matter how much stuff we have, after a short time, it loses its appeal. It's really interesting. You think about people who have trouble, spend a lot of time in a, seeing psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, 
suicide rates, they're really high among the, higher among the wealthy than they are among the less fortunate. That's something. What's the opposite of contentment? Being content, being satisfied with what the Lord's given us and the place the Lord's put us for this time. What's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is covetousness. Covetousness. You ever heard that? Do not covet. Where do we see that in the Bible? Yeah, it's, some of the kids are doing this. Yeah, we, we, we learned the Ten Commandments, and we, we one, two, three, four, we run down through there. But the tenth one is, is kind of the, it's like this, but then we, what are we doing? We're grabbing. Yeah, the tenth, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Is, you should not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. What does it mean to covet? I think it's a, a desire for something belonging to another. And, and it stinks with discontentment. It's an inappropriate desire to take something that someone else owns. It's almost like lust. You think about lust. Lust is a desire for something forbidden. But to covet is a desire for something that belongs to another. And it's a selfish thing, isn't it? It's, it's not simply wanting something we don't have, but it's wanting something that someone else has. And we see it all through Scripture. There's texts that help us with this. Psalm 119, verse 36, a great verse to memorize, a great prayer for us. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to, towards selfish gain. And we said last week, just as anxiety is caused by unbelief, but that anxiety leads to other sins. I'm really anxious, and so my boss asked me about, hey, did you, did you fail to turn in this report? So what are you tempted to do? And some people, they'll lie because they're anxious. Just as anxiety leads to other sins, so does coveting leads to other sins. I mean, we covet. We looked in that passage in Exodus 20 about coveting. A, we lust, and so what do we do? It may lead to coveting, which may lead to adultery. I desire somebody else's husband or someone else's wife. Or it can lead to adultery. It leads to other things. So we have to be really careful. Think about Achan. When he took the forbidden things, when the Israelites fought against Ai, Joshua 7, 21, this is what... Achan says, when I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them, and then, what it, then I took them. Coveting led to other things. God had said, don't touch those things. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. And what was the, the, the result of that is he lost his life, he and his family. Yeah. Think about others, Jezebel and Ahab. They coveted Naboth's vineyard. They wanted it, so what they do? They went and put him to death, and then they took it. Or David. The incident with Bathsheba, what happened? He coveted another man's wife, and so he had him put to death, and then he took her as his own. Yeah, we see this coveting leads to other things. James chapter 4 what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. What causes fights and quarrels among you? You covet. Discontentment. Yeah. Think about coveting. It's a violation of the second great commandment. You remember Jesus, he summarized the Ten Commandments in two do you remember that, Matthew? Uh, where is that, Matthew 22? There we go. And Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And then the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. He's summarizing the law here with these two commandments. 
Love God, love neighbor. When we covet, we want somebody else's, what they have, or, and willing to take it if, if we have a chance. Yeah, we're, we're not loving our neighbor as ourselves, Putting our interest and our needs above theirs. How are we doing with that? Are you content with what you have? Or are you discontent? Wanting more. Jesus warned against coveting, Luke 12, 13 through 15. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell me, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. And he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Don't love possessions that belong to others so much that it makes you want to acquire them, make an effort to get them. There's a warning in Ephesians 5. This will kind of make us think a little bit, I think. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. When we lived overseas, we would talk about the, the law and the Ten Commandments and how we're, we're sinful. And, and because we're sinful, we need a Savior. And, and it's interesting how people, the, the, I don't murder and I don't commit adultery and I don't steal and I don't lie too much. But then you get to, to coveting. And there was always, that always got them, especially in their culture, because it's really um, kind of a keep up with the Joneses kind of culture. But he calls it idolatry. It's interesting in the Ten Commandments, it starts out, don't have another God before me. Remember the first commandment? Have no other gods before me. But then you see that the last, the coveting, number 10, but that's what's happening. You're putting another God, another thing, seeing something else is more important than God. When you're willing to sin to get it, that's an idol. It's more important at that moment than, than the Lord is to you. So coveting is a desire, an intense desire, so much so that you, you lose your contentment with God. And when our con contentment with God and our trust in God decreases, then coveting increases. So again, getting back to the, why do we covet? Because we don't trust the Lord. We don't believe his promises that he can meet our needs and he will meet our needs. That he's sufficient for us. He's not enough. When we covet, we're saying God's not enough. Third, thirdly, in verse 13, we can be content and resist the temptation to covet because of our faith in Jesus, who is our source of strength. This is a familiar verse. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So he says, we can learn to be content. I've learned to be content. And then he says, I can do all things. All things, that's kind of a often misunderstood, isn't it? Motivational preachers or speakers, they'll use this a lot. You can do whatever you set your mind to. You can do it. You got this. Or nowadays, they say, oh, you're going to kill it. You're going to kill it. You can do it. If you have enough faith in Christ, you'll be able to accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. But here, what, what he's doing here, verse 13, he's telling him his, his, his source of contentment. Paul can be content when he lacked because of Christ. Christ is a source of strength and grace. So how does he strengthen us? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How does the Lord strengthen us? We see this throughout the New Testament, the Old Testament, 2 Timothy 2, 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We see this, these prayers of Paul, the apostles, that, that the believers would be strengthened. Ephesians 6, 10, the armor of God. Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We have Psalm 18, 31, 32. For who is God but the Lord, and who is a rock except our God, the God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless? Now, think about this for a second. How does the Lord strengthen us? 
Now, what is he talking about here? Is this spiritual strength or is this physical strength? Well, I think it's probably both. I mean, think about it. There's times in your life you need to get something done. Maybe you're caring for a, someone who's uh, not well, and maybe you just hadn't had good sleep. Or maybe you, know, you, you had something going on at home or you're trying to minister to somebody, but then you have to go to work and you're just struggling. And on the way to work, you're driving and you're not. And you're like, Lord, I need you. Help me. Lord, you know I didn't sleep. You know I don't feel well. Lord, I need you to help me get through the day. I don't know that I can get through the day if you don't help me. And somehow, you're driving home, and you're like, Lord, I'm not even, I don't even know why I'm not tired. How is it that I'm not tired? Because God's given us grace. Physically, he, sometimes he strengthens us, but it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't explain it. We don't know how to happen. We see it all through Scripture of God strengthening people physically. But also, he strengthens us not just physically, but spiritually as well. And how does he strengthen us spiritually? And this is the tie-in to the last two weeks. He always strengthens us spiritually through the promises in his word. Through the promises in his word. We need God to strengthen us. God, will you really do what you say you're going to do? It's like this light at the end of the tunnel thing. I was at the hospital this last week, and Janice Daniel, she's there, and she has a, an ulcer. We've been praying for her, and, and she, I saw her yesterday. She's doing better physically, and, and, um, but she's at the hospital, and her arm is just from, from, from wrist to shoulders, just purple, like dark purple. They've been drawing blood, drawing blood, drawing blood. And they come in and they're like, we got to see if you need a, another blood transfusion. i got to get some blood from you. And she's like, oh. the nurse comes, and I'm so sorry, i got to get some blood. And so we're, I'm sitting there with her and I say, hey, niece, it's going to hurt, but it's only going to hurt for just a second. There's, she's just gonna get, it's just going to take a second. And so she grabbed her arm, and niece kind of did this, kind of gritted her teeth, and she was poking around, and the veins were collapsing. But it just took just a short time. 10, 15 seconds, and it was done. My kids, we went overseas. They had to get shot after shot after shot after shot. Most kids don't like shot. Carly was like, can I get another one? She would ask. She would get shot. She would say, I'll take another. You know, and the other kids are screaming bloody murder. She's kind of a different child. That's why she's in nursing school, I guess. Now she's going to start giving them. But, but my kids would say, Daddy, is it going to hurt? And I'd say, yeah. Yeah, it's going to hurt. Every time, yeah, it's going to hurt. Very, very, very seldom do you get a shot and it don't hurt. Caitlin, she'd probably give a shot, doesn't hurt. Christina, probably. Miss Cindy, probably. But most of the time you get a shot, it's going to hurt. And I say, yeah, it's going to hurt, but it's only going to hurt for a second. So don't let, you know, they're anticipating, you know, it's going to happen in the afternoon. So all day they're kind of sick at their stomach and scared. Say, don't ruin your day over three seconds of pain. It's going to hurt, but it's just going to hurt but it's just a second. And sure enough, they get that shot, and it's, oh, it's hurting, and then it'd be done. Huh? Oh, it didn't last long. Yeah, that's kind of how it is with us spiritually. We go through life, and we struggle, and we go through pain, and we go through difficulty, and we go through hard times. But then we have God's promises. Yeah, his promises doesn't say he, we're not going to struggle, we're not going to hurt, that life's not going to be difficult, that our heart's not going to be broken, that physically we're not going to, ache and hurt and struggle and suffer. But he's got these promises. It's just gonna it's just gonna be for a little while. Yeah, you're going through this struggle and this this sin problem that you just it's just so difficult to overcome. But you know the, the work I begin in you, I'm gonna finish. You know, one day I'm not gonna be prideful. One day I'm not gonna be lazy. One day I'm, I'm not going to be selfish. Oh. So what does that do? That, that motivates me to carry on, press on. God gives us his promises. And as we study and read his promises and trust them, we can get through and we can persevere and we can have strength. 
I can go through this difficulty. It seems like I'm lacking something here, but I can go through that because God has promised that He's going to sustain me. He's not going to leave me nor forsake me. The work He began in me, He's going to finish. One day I'm going to be like Jesus in glory. Yeah, that strengthens us. That strengthens us. Coveting is a problem we all struggle with. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. Turn, turn there, if you would. 1 Timothy, go right. Just go right a few books. 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, 1st Timothy. If you're black, pew Bible, it's page 1180. Let's read this text real quickly. I was talking to uh, the same shut-in yesterday. and She's like, you preach for like an hour. I said, really? I thought it was like 40 minutes. No, it's an hour. I said, you can't count music, singing time or prayer time. I'm about to finish up. Bear with me. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at verse 6 through 12. And, and small group leaders, you'll, this, is a, this is a text where if I were you, if I was leading a small group, I'd probably land here and spend a lot of time here when dealing with contentment. Look at 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Man, if you could be content, boy, that's going to really help you. For we brought nothing into the world. Why? Why do we need to be content? He's telling us in verse 7, 8, 9. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of the world. We've already talked about that. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kind of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Why do we need to be content? Can't take your stuff with you. Covetousness leads to all kind of grief in life. Some may even fall away from the faith, abandon the faith, and be lost forever. Notice what it says there in verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee discontentment. Flee coveting. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. How do we fight covetousness? By trusting God's promises. Notice that he says faith twice. We've got to trust the Lord. Got to trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. It's hard to trust the Lord when you don't know what he says. I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord. Do you? You won't trust the Lord if you don't know his promises. You don't know his word. That's why it's important that we read the word, study the word, be taught the word. We can do everything. We can be content in all things because of Christ. I can endure all that happens on the outside because I am strengthened by Christ on the inside. As I study His Word, remember His promises. John 15, 5, in the context of abiding, is abiding in Christ. Christ says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Abide in me. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Abide in me. Draw near to me. Meditate on my promises for you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ and his word, as we trust in his promises, we can be strengthened and we can be content. How do we apply this to our lives? We've been talking about this last three weeks. Just, I believe, help my unbelief. Well, once again, if you're here and you've never 
repented, you never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, you will never be fully content. Your life will be eat up with discontentment and coveting because it's, you're not ever going to be satisfied. The, the writer of Ecclesiastes, he says, God has put eternity in our hearts. What that means is you're not going to be satisfied. Only, only God, only Christ is going to satisfy you. And if you're, you've yet to trust Christ, the work that he did on this earth for you, you're going to be discontent. You're not going to be satisfied. So my admonishment for you, my encouragement for you, if you've never repented and believed, is today you repent, turn from your sin, turn from living for yourself, turn from trying to be content on your own by buying all stuff and getting all the goods and taking from other people. Repent of that and trust the work Christ did on the cross for you. Cry out to God and say, God, I'm wrong. I've been wrong. I need you to save me. I need to be forgiven. I want to know you. I do trust that Christ died for me and, and his work is sufficient for my salvation. Save me, Lord. Maybe you need to pray something like that to the Lord. Maybe for us as a church, just by way of application, we need to ask the Lord for help. We need to ask the Lord for help. We need to pray that prayer. Father, I, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. Maybe that Psalm 119, 36, incline my heart to your testimonies and not towards selfish gain. That would be a great, great verse to memorize, a great verse to pray. I think, thirdly, by way of application, we need to remind ourselves of the dangers of coveting. That passage in 1 Timothy 6, 9. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Our, one of our memory verses this week, Luke 12, 15, and he says to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. We need to be reminded of these things, memorize these verses, so we can be strengthened in Christ. Hebrews 13, 5, dealing with context of money. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's been real helpful for me just thinking about my own, uh, my own struggles, my own um, difficulties with anxiety that I struggle with, discontentment, coveting other people's stuff. And it's all a result of my lack of faith in, in the Lord and his promises. So we as a church, we need to grow in this area, I believe. And so let's begin to study the scriptures. Maybe, you're, maybe you hadn't been studying the scriptures. If you're a believer and you hadn't been studying the scriptures, you're not going to be strengthened. You need to know God's will and know his promises and be reminded of those over and over and over again. So let's read the word. Maybe you're a part of the, our church family, but you're not involved in a small group. That would help you. Learning the promises of God, being encouraged. I would encourage you to be a, be a part of something like that, a small group. I'm excited about Wednesday night. We're going to have more time to be together to study. Encourage one another. Really look forward to that. So, let's pray, and we'll be um, we'll let Chris come up and start dismissing us here. Father, we acknowledge your goodness in our life, and we're so thankful for your word as you give it to us. And we know that your word can make wise the simple. And Father, we need help. We need to be made wise. And Lord, we are discontent. I struggle with coveting and not trusting your promises. and I struggle with anxiety because I don't trust your word. And Father, we, so many of us here, we do trust the work of Christ, but we, we, we lack faith. So help our unbelief. As we study this week, Father, bring these verses to our remembrance as we try to work on these memory verses. I pray that you would just help us. Give us grace to, to memorize and, and hide your word in our heart.
Father, may we be content in you. And may we trust you to meet all our needs. And for some, we're, we're, some of us are going through difficult things in life and we're in hard, maybe it's a marriage trouble, maybe it's financial trouble, physically, battling illness. Lord, help us even in those difficulties to be content like Paul was, knowing that you're sovereign over all things and you're going to supply what we need. And Father, if there's anyone here that's not a believer, they've yet to repent and believe, Father, I pray that you would allow the, the gospel message that's been shared today to ring loud in their ears, that you would grant them faith and repentance, that they would know you as the good shepherd. And Lord, they would begin to be satisfied in you and you alone. Father, I'm so thankful for the folks you brought to us today, our, our church family and visitors, and thankful for Brandon and him being here and the encouragement that is to me. And, Chuck being here, the Lawrences, man, what a blessing. The Starnes family, just a, a blessing. I just pray that you'd bless them in a special way. And, Lord, there's some here that just trying to figure out where they need to be as far as church family, where they need to put down roots. I pray that you'd direct their steps, whether it be here or elsewhere, to where you would have them be. Lord, what a, a sweet day it's been. Thank you for the, all those who serve today, of teaching Sunday school and, and teaching children and leading worship and greeting folks and running sound what a what a blessing to be a part of a sweet church help us be faithful to you this week help us be content in jesus name amen come on up chris we do have a few announcements this morning uh, morgan picked up a couple of them uh he shared you know what we're doing on wednesday um, so I'm just going to elaborate on that a little bit. This is a great time on Wednesday. I mean, everybody's getting back into school, live settling back down, so it's a great time to invite uh, someone. If you're a young person and you've been witnessing to or you know, trying to share the gospel with one of your friends, it's a great time to bring them, have them come with you. Same thing for adults. I mean, there's probably somebody, as you think about uh, folks in your life, somebody that you'd love to have here with you, this is a great opportunity to bring them. Uh, when you think about why you can, you know, why do you come to church? Fellowship is, is high on the list, certainly, but it's also to, to learn these lessons like we're learning this morning. Uh, Shane sends out our, our scriptures earlier in the week, and I read this one before, uh, before today. And as I thought about it, that was the first thing I thought about. I thought about a person in my life who I thought, you know, Contentment robs you of joy, and this person uh, that I'd love to see here with us um, allows discontentment to rob them of their joy. So I thought, you know, I invited them, invited them to come, and they didn't come. But but uh, I'm gonna keep keep inviting them. But now I gotta, now I gotta confess something. So as I was thinking about this person and the fact that they they are discontent. I was driving to church this morning, and yesterday, Kim Glass's brother Nathan was helping me work on something in my barn. I got it's not a huge barn by most people's standards, but it's two levels, and I was having to move junk out of the way, you know, to try to do what I needed to do, and it was aggravating me. So as I'm driving to church this morning, I'm like, I gotta build a shed. I need a shed so I can take all the stuff out of my barn, and I have room to work. So thank you, brother. You, you saved me some money. <laughs> Miss Novell is probably going to lose a slab out of you, yeah, but you know, it's, for me, you saved me some money. So say that all to say, it's you know, we all need to hear these lessons. No longer, no how, no matter how long we've been coming to church, we all need to hear these lessons. So thank you for that one this morning, bro. Um, next Sunday, I know it's a holiday weekend, but if you're in town, join us, men, for our monthly men's uh, breakfast and devotional time. Uh, Brother Charles is going to share, so it's going to be great. Uh, love to have you with us if you're in town. Make sure and come. Uh, looking a little farther out, September 12th is the Confidential Care Banquet for those who signed up for that. And then the third weekend in October, uh, that's October 18th and the 19th, uh, the men are going to meet at Chickasaw State Park near Henderson uh, for a fall men's retreat. And that Friday evening, 
uh, the 18th at 6 p.m. There's going to be a women's fall gathering. It says they're going to have festive food, crafts, and fellowship. Uh, men, probably no crafts, but we're going to eat whatever we can cook in its own grease on a black stone, uh, and we're going to have great fellowship and great Bible study. So come, come and join us. And then one last thing on the memory verses. Uh, in our small group last week, um, there were a couple of mobile apps that were shared. Uh, Shane has challenged me on this memorization thing as I just told him. I said, I can't memorize things. I mean, it's just full. There's not much room left in there. If something goes in, something's got to go out. Sometimes it's important. Um, so um, I had used that for an excuse for a long time. But, but this time, I'm really, I'm really trying. And Kristen... She helped me this morning. I actually was able to say say them mostly in the in the truck coming to church, so uh, she can she can attest to that. But anyway, the mobile apps did help me. So uh, ask your small group leader, get with me, whatever. It's like two ninety nine. It's less than a bad cheeseburger. Uh, load the app and it'll help you. So. Oh. 